not at this point, so then let's continue with very brief history lesson. So now let's talk about wide area networks, cellular networks. Um, so we have almost five generations uh, of cell networks up to now. Um, roughly every 10 years we get a new one. So the very first one, first generation, this was the so-called uh, CNETs in Germany, which was uh, mostly for, uh, for car phones and so on because they were really quite bulky and heavy. So maybe some of you remember the movie Wall Street, the original one, um, where it was quite, quite novel to actually have a, a portable phone, but it was still like a whole briefcase which you had to carry around and which weighed like five kilos maybe. And so it had, may, uh, I think it had um, 9.6 kilobit of data rate, so you could actually use that for data transmission already, but at a, at a very, very low rate. And it had a frequency division scheme. So every, every mobile phone actually got its own frequency slot, and for that reason you couldn't have a lot of them. Um, second generation GSM is still available, so this was already a digital scheme, this time with uh, dynamic time division access, so each device tries to listen for a free channel and then transmit. Um, at best, you can get maybe 200 gigabits out of, of 2G, and some countries are actually starting to turn off their 2G networks now. So if you have an uh, old, old phone that's not 3 G capable, then in some countries you may actually start running into problems at some point in the future because it simply won't work anymore. Then uh, 3G, what we, what's the current standard everywhere more, more or less, also called UMTS, also a digital, um, digital uh, scheme using this code division multiple access now. You can get up to maybe uh, 20 megabits under the right conditions. And what's also important, this is a kind of a hybrid network. So uh, with each iteration, the, the backend network, the support structure was getting more and more complex. And especially um, they, there was this old approach of circuit switched networks. Maybe I don't know if that's a, a known distinction. So circuit switched meant that between a transmitter and a receiver, you had a point to point connection and that was really reserved across the whole network. And this is a, a relic from, the, uh, from maybe 100 years ago where you really had basically a switchboard where someone uh, put a couple of plugs in and made a physical connection and then that connection was reserved for one telephone call, for example. And that relic has carried over until now. So there are still in the backend network, there are uh, channel reservations for, for specific phone calls and so on, and this is called a circuit switch network. And on the other hand, uh, the more modern approach basically is packet switch networks, where you distribute uh, or where you split every transmission into small packets of data and just put those packets into the network and basically let the network decide um, how to transmit the packets to the other side. So there's no more single reserved channel for one connection, but there's just the whole network. And as the packets go in at one end are somehow distributed through the network and hopefully all come back out at the other end. And 3G is pretty complex because it tries to combine both, um, both approaches in the, in the back end. For that reason, uh, Fourth generation networks, LTE, for example, is actually in some regards a little simpler than 3G because uh, the entire support network is now entirely packet switched. So you don't have these, these old circuit switched relics anymore, which basically simulate a 100 year old phone network, but you just have packets just like on the internet. Um, so it's actually I think it's actually based on, on IP also. Um, and for that reason, a little simpler than um, what, you, what you get with 3G. But that just refers to the, to the support structure mostly. Um, well, and 5G is maybe, is, is now in the planning phase. People are actually discussing what the, the, what the 5G standard should look like. And some countries are already planning 5G installations 
starting in maybe four or five years, so at some point in the future. Um, this will also be available, but right now there's not much known about how it will actually look like. Right now we have mostly 3G and 4G. 4G will, if it's working right, then you can get up to 300 megabits, which sounds very, very good, but also again under the, the right conditions uh, only. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, up to a point, yes, but not so, well, not so much in Germany, as far as I can tell, because of legal reasons, because it's very unclear if, if you have an a open Wi-Fi hotspot, then uh, if somebody does something illegal over your Wi-Fi router, then are you liable or not? So that's, that's a little murky in Germany, and for that reason, the, the hotspot coverage here, at least here, isn't very good, in my opinion. Um, and of course, you have these kind of, of data plans, for example, from T-Mobile or something, where you can also switch to specific T-Mobile hotspots at no charge, uh, but those aren't also aren't that widely distributed, in my opinion. Um, so that's mostly from personal experience that, that may differ uh, if, if you have the right provider, maybe. But actually right, what, what, what I'm kind of seeing, I think, right now is that people actually try to uh, increase the coverage of the, the next generation networks, 4G and in the future 5G, uh, by so much that Wi-Fi kind of starts to become obsolete because you always have, if you always and everywhere have 300 megabit of bandwidth uh, with your mobile, then you wouldn't actually need Wi-Fi for a lot of things anymore. So, but mm, that's just an just, uh, just, uh, educated guess, basically. Um, other questions up to here? So, um, let's look a little more into UMTS. I already mentioned this hybrid between uh, circuit switched and, and packet switched. Um, a big problem or depending on, on from, what, uh, from what point of view you look at it, a big problem is that you don't actually get a lot of access to, to much of what uh, is relevant for UMTS. So um, an example, this is how the protocol stack for UMTS looks like. Um, so uh, you have lots of uh, protocols which you already know, HTTP, TCP, IP, and then you get a lot more protocols which you actually never heard of, PDCP, RLC, UTRAN, and so on. So uh, this is also kind of uh, organized like the um, ISO stack we looked at. So at the very lowest bottom, we have the physical layer. Then here we have data link. Then here we sometimes have uh, another IP layer in between. And um, the important part is that as a, as a regular user, um, you basically never get to see any, any of this. This is all hidden in a completely separate module, the so-called baseband module in your phone, for example, which is uh, uh, entire computer in its own right with its own operating system, its own crypto engine, and so on and so on. And um, it's very difficult to actually touch any of this if you if you want to want to look into it. As as the user, you only get to deal with the regular protocols like HTTP and so on. So on the mobile device itself, you actually only get to see this little part, and if you communicate with some server on the other side, then this part, and the entire rest is more or less inaccessible. Um, of course, that hasn't prevented people from actually looking into that, so there are um, open source solutions which actually encapsulate this whole thing, so you can actually build your own base station. It's pretty involved, I think, but it's possible. Um, you need some specialized hardware, of course, which can transmit and receive on more frequencies at the same time than the, the regular baseband module because you actually want to simulate a whole base station. Um, but it's possible. 
and of because of what you see here, because of all the protocols involved, it's of course um, yeah pretty complex. But for a regular mobile device, you never get access to any of this. You just put on, put on in your your SIM pin, and that's more or less everything you uh, you communicate with the uh, baseband module. So. Um, the order of the slides was actually swapped. So um, here's a look at how the UMTS network looks like internally. So again, what, what we as users actually get to see is more or less just this. Um, but then we have lots of different subsystems. So for, uh, for example, we have the base station subsystem, of course, which is what's uh, on, every, on every third rooftop maybe. Um, the base station is composed of uh, usually of several radio cells which go into different directions um, to, to improve the coverage. And they are uh, then connected to a base station controller. So uh, it's not, not necessary to actually uh, know this entire diagram and every piece of it. But from time to time, I'll pick it back up again and point out specific components which, which are of interest. So um, what's also interesting, and we'll get into, this, into that later today, is in the core network, we have stuff like these home location and visitor location registers, which kind of pinpoint where specific mobile devices are and which base station they're connected to. And then uh, we have this uh, also this administration part where stuff like the billing and the the uh, the contract handling and so is done for each mobile network. And um, at some point below here, connected of course to the base station controller, then we have gateways, for example, to the internet or also to the to the conventional old style uh, circuit switch telephone network. So not too important to go into too much detail here, just suffice to say it's a really, really complex system and it also has a lot of legacy, uh, legacy stuff in there which is just exists to talk to um, or emulate, uh, for example, old telephone networks. Already talked about this. So yeah, to Summarize again briefly what we uh, looked at are three different families of standards, one for each of the big classes of networks. We didn't yet talk about mesh networks. Which, if you remember, I mentioned mesh networks uh, last time, which are kind of a, a fourth class of network. But um, so far, these aren't really out of the research stage. Um, there are some standards which are on top of Wi-Fi and there are some standards or CMA standards which are on top of Bluetooth, but there's not yet one uh, universal, universal mesh network standard. So for that reason, I haven't covered it here yet. And yeah, so, so much for this part. Are there any further questions up to here? <laughs>